Okay, good morning everybody and Hazak Baruch, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Thursday morning as we are studying together Perashat Pinhas. And we know that um, each Perasha, each Perasha, at the end of the Perasha, we read what's called the Haftara. We read a piece, a portion from the prophets, okay? The reason we do this is because there was a time in Jewish history where we weren't um, allowed to read from the Torah, the Goyim, the enemy did not allow it. And therefore they kind of locked us, uh, they locked uh, the Torah away from us. We weren't allowed to read. So what do we read instead? We decided, as a Jew always does, we improvise. We read from the prophets a piece from the Navi that's very connected somehow to the Perashat Shavua. Well, the Perasha, the Haftara of our Perasha, Perasha Pinhas, is about Eliyahu Hanavi, and of course the connection of Eliyahu Hanavi with Pinhas is very clear. We know that uh, Pinhas, according to our sages, according to our rabbis, eventually um, Pinhas eventually was Eliyahu Hanavi, whether it's through a Gilgul or he himself. Different opinions. The Haftara is not always read though in Perashat Pinhas, unfortunately. Because we know that whenever we are in the three weeks from Shiva Asar Betamuz to Tisha Be'av, whenever we're in the three weeks, we don't read the regular Haftarah. Instead, the Haftarah is replaced with um, one of the three uh, Haftarot of um, Shlosha de Paranuta, it's called. Okay, Haftarah of Calamity, leading up to Tisha Be'av. And so this week, this year is no exception to the rule. This year as well, we're not going to read the Haftarah of Pinhas. We're going to read instead the um, the regular reading of the three weeks uh, in the Haftarah. However, it is worth studying the Haftarah anyways, because um, A, it's part of our Navi, it's part of our Torah. But even more importantly, I believe that if we study the Haftarah correctly, we will find that it uh, contains lessons that are very relevant, not only for life, but for the time of the year that we are in right now. Just to quickly go through the Haftarah. Okay, the Haftarah is um, it's the aftermath of a famous encounter that Eliyahu Hanavi has with the, um, with, the, uh, with the prophets. So basically, just to quickly go through the story, Eliyahu Hanavi was a good prophet, a good guy. You had on the other side, all these fake prophets, Nevi'eh Baal, that they were preaching uh, false ideas, trying to promote false and fake gods. Eliyahu Navi decides that for once and for all, we have to put it to the test to prove once and for all who is the real prophet, who is the real God. So he tells all of them to take, to come onto the mountain, the famous Har Karmel, and uh, they'll do a test on that mountain. And the test, we know how it went. They took two cows equal in size, equal in age. They build two Mizbechot, one for the fake prophets, one for Eliyahu and Navi. The, um, sorry. Okay, they, they, go, they go onto the mountain and each one screams out to their God. And whichever God is the one that, whichever God answers, is proven that they're emet, that they're truth. Well, the false prophets, they go out and they scream and pray and pray. And of course, Nobody comes, nobody answers. Eliyahu Navi finally, he gets up there. He prays, Aneni Hashem Aneni. Boom! Fire comes down, consumes the Mizbeach, consumes the cow, and everybody screams out, Amonai Hu HaElokim, Amonai Hu HaElokim. God is the real God. God is the, God is the Lord. Our Haftarah continues from this moment and on. So our Haftarah is the end of that story. The king, of course, Ahav and his wife Izebel did not want to, you know, they didn't want to change their lifestyle. They did not concede to Eliyahu that Hashem is legitimate. And they decided instead, uh, instead of, you know, bowing to Eliyahu and saying, you're right, they decided to kill Eliyahu and Avi. Eliyahu was forced to flee for his life. And um, he arrives, um, to, to, um, to the mountain. Now he's going in the desert and he's, he's, he's running away from his, from, his, from his community, from everywhere. He has nowhere to go. The king wants to kill him. 
And it's amazing, by the way, that you would think a guy like Eliyahu Navi, <laughs> he's a prophet, he can do whatever he wants. So if the Navi's trying to kill you, if, if the king's trying to kill you, then just do your magic, you know what I mean? Just, you know, take out your wand and just do your, you know, abracadabra spell, Harry Potter style, and boom, kill him. But of course, that's not how it works. And this is just another clear example of how in life, we have to be responsible. We have to play by the rules. We're not allowed to go against nature. Okay, if a person is, uh, if a person is being chased, in Somchim al you can't rely on miracles, even if your name is Eliyahu Navi. So he's running away for his life and he's exclaiming and he's screaming and pronouncing that Hashem, uh, to Hashem, that he has endured all these sufferings and he requests, he says Hashem, very, very few times do people actually, do we find this idea, but he asks to get, he asks Hashem to kill him. He says Hashem, Vayish'al et nafsho lamut. He says, God, just kill me now. I fought enough. I've seen enough. I've, went, I've gone through enough. Okay? Life has been difficult for me. I'm always fighting for your cause. And he tells him, Rav ata Hashem kah nafshi. Just take my soul away. He goes to sleep. He wakes up and he, he sees miraculously food that has been set up by God for him. He eats. He has a little bit more energy. And um, Hashem, he gets, to a, he gets to a mountain. He's on this mountain and just fast forward for a minute. God says to him, um, Eliyahu, what are, you, what are you doing here on this mountain? What brings you here? Ma lecha po Eliyahu, the famous line. And Eliyahu says, Kano, the famous words, Kano kineti so I'm reading right now in the book of Melachim, Kings, chapter 19, Pasuk 10. Eliyahu Navi says to God, I, have, I am Kano Kineti. I have been exceedingly zealous for you, Hashem, because the Jewish people have forsaken your Torah. And I'm, I'm running away from my life. And after this episode, God says to Eliyahu Navi, what does he tell him? Anoint Elisha in your stead. Appoint Elisha. And we wonder, what is, what is the purpose of appointing a new prophet right now? We might be inclined to think <clears throat> that this is actually Hashem's way of rewarding Eliyahu. It's to alleviate his pain. Listen, Eliyahu, I know you went through a lot. You fought a lot. It's time for you to retire. It's time for you to relax. It's time for you to take a, take a little bit of a break. You're going to have someone who's going to succeed you. Hazaku Baruch. And so, <clears throat> this is going to be Elisha Hanavi. Elisha the prophet will take your place. However, this is not how all the rabbis understood this episode. Okay? Rabbi Bernstein says something very, very powerful. When it comes to a prophet, what is the job of a Navi? What is the job of a leader? <laughs> Excuse me. A leader's job is actually twofold. Number one, a leader has to deal with the people regarding their waywardness to Hashem. So in a way, he has to defend God's honor and rebuke the people. What are you doing? Is not what Hashem wants. How could you sin? Right? This is called demanding the honor of the Father, of Hashem. That is one um, purpose of, of, uh, of a leader. However, he operates on a different plane as well. A Navi, besides for dealing with the people and defending Hashem, he now has to do the exact opposite. When dealing with Hashem, he must defend the people. Okay, so there's this, this conundrum that exists in the life of a leader. To always play both sides when dealing with the people, to rebuke them. How could you act like this to God? And then when dealing with God, to so to speak, rebuke God and demand that He forgive His people. It's kind of like a mother. When the father yells at the children, the mother comes and says to her husband, it's not how you talk to them, you have to be patient, right? 
And then when the father goes to work, she quickly turns around and says to the kids, come on kids, how could you do that, right? They're always playing both sides of the equation. And there are, these are the two realms. And um, there have been prophets in history that have done one. There have been prophets in history that have done the other. And there have been prophets in history that have done both. And the ideal prophet is one who does both. So as an example of a prophet that, have, that has only cared about the demanding the honor of the child. Because again, there's the child, honor of the father and the honor of the child. Ideally, a prophet should emphasize and plead both cases. But there have been points in history of a prophet only demanding the honor of the child. Who is that an example of? If you want to take a minute and write it down. Who has only demanded the honor of a child? This is Yonah Hanavi. Remember Yonah? We read about him on Yom Kippur. God sends Jonah to go down and to rebuke the city of Nineveh. Now, a prophet, what he should have done is to care about the children and also care about God. So go to Nineveh and rebuke them and then go to God and ask, but you know what, well, you know what Yonah does? He only demands the honor of the child. So he doesn't go to the city of Nineveh. He doesn't go and, de and deliver his prophecy. Instead, he runs onto a ship he tries to run away from Israel. He tries to run away from God. Because if I'm away from Israel, God can't talk to me. He runs away from Eretz Israel on a ship. And we know how the story plays out. There's a huge storm at sea about to capsize the ship until they throw him overboard. And Yonah is swallowed by a fish and then another fish. And finally, he goes and he delivers his prophecy. But Yonah, we wonder, why did he run away from God's Prophecy. Why run away from the Nevoah? Why not deliver it? And the answer is because Yonah was afraid and he knew that if he were to rebuke the city of Nineveh, they would listen. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that Nineveh was a non-Jewish city. And if they listen, it's going to look and reflect very negatively upon the Jewish people. Yonah was afraid that if they listen, the, the Midat Hadin, so to speak, the attribute of God's justice would come out and criticize the Jewish nation and say, look, a non-Jewish people listen to the prophets. The Jews don't even listen to the prophets. That would look very bad for us. So out of our respect to defend us, Yonah <clears throat> didn't listen to Hashem. This is an example of somebody defending the honor of the children. There have been people that have done both, that have defended the honor of God and the children. Of course, this is Moshe Rabbeinu. When, when the Jewish people commit Chet HaEgel, um, Moshe is a classic example of this. On the one hand, he confronts the people of all their wrongdoings, not only with the Egel. They're asking inappropriately for water, for food. He rebukes them nonstop in the Torah. And, um, and the, old, the, book, the book of Deuteronomy, the entire book of Devarim, is Moshe giving out harsh punishments to different people where, uh, where necessary, whether it's Korach or the Merah, it doesn't matter who. Breaking the tablets by the Egel, you name it. He will do anything to defend God's honor. But at the very same time, that very same leader that breaks the tablets, when he goes back to Hashem, when he goes back to speak to God about the people, he will do anything to defend them. Even asking, Erase me if you must. But you must forgive the Jewish people. And if not, get, get rid of me. Forget about me, Hashem. I will not move on. I will not be a leader for a nation if you cannot forgive them. If you cannot find it in your heart to forgive them. Wipe me out along with them. That is the, that is the greatness of a true leader. A true leader rebukes the people when necessary and then he turns around and he, he puts on these two different you know, masks. He wears the rebuke the people hat and then, the, and then defend the people hat. Like every good mother. Compare this though, unfortunately, and this is not me, God forbid, I would never have the guts to say this. This is the Mechilta. The Mechilta in Pirashat Bo says, but when it came to Eliyahu, Eliyahu only defended the honor of the father, but not of that of the children. Where is the source of this, you know, statement? 
You know, you're, you're right now criticizing Eliyahu Anavi, one of the greatest prophets, saying that he did not defend the honor of the, peop of the people. And it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a critique on, on this man, on Eliyahu Anavi. What's the source? How do we know it? And the Haftarah, the, the Mechilta, the Midrash points to our Haftarah, this week's Perasha. When God asks Eliyahu, Ma lecha po Eliyahu? What are you doing here, Eliyahu? What are you doing on this mountain? What brings you here? Remember, we just explained the Haftarah. He ran away from the people because they were trying to kill him. And he winds up on this, on this mountain, which our rabbis say was actually Har Chorev. Anyone know what Har Chorev is? Chorev is Har Sinai. So Eliyahu winds up on Har Sinai, like Moshe Rabbeinu. And he also, by the way, doesn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights, like who? Moshe Rabbeinu. And when God says to him, what brings you here? He says, Pasuk Yud, Vayomer Kano Kineti, I'm extremely zealot. I have zeal, great zeal for Hashem, the King of Legions, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have destroyed your altars and killed your prophets. God, the Jews have sinned badly. When speaking to Hashem about the Jewish people, Eliyahu Hanavi fails. He only criticized the people. He did not try to defend them. He didn't try to plead their case. But not only that, the Mechilta concludes and says something scary. It's for this reason and this reason alone that at the end of the episode, what does God say to the Navi? God says to Eliyahu, you know what? So appoint Elisha. Place a different prophet in your stead. Not because he's going to succeed you. Not because he's going to relieve you of your duties. Not because he's going to give you a hand. Not because now we're going to make life easier on you because you worked so hard so now you could retire. He's not succeeding you. He's replacing you. You understood that? He's not succeeding. He's replacing. You're being replaced, Eliyahu. You are fired. You have failed to plead the cause of the Jewish people when speaking to Hashem. You are disqualified as a prophet. And only the Midrash can say this. Hashem said to Eliyahu, I no longer have desire for your prophecy. Scary. And by the way, the Radbaz adds, this is precisely why Hashem did what He did with this entire episode of Eliyahu and Avi. He runs for 40 days on a mountain, no bread, no water, like Moshe Rabbeinu. He winds up on Har Sinai, like Moshe Rabbeinu. He ends up being in the same exact cave where Moshe was when Moshe prayed for forgiveness for the Jewish people, like Moshe Rabbeinu. Why, why all of the comparisons? What's the purpose of all of this? Why does Hashem let Eliyahu and Avi journey for so many days to go so far to tell him, by the way, you're fired? Why not tell him right away? Tell him in the beginning, when he's in the desert, hey, listen, time for you to, to appoint someone else. No, he wants him to travel for 40 days, to get to Har Sinai, to go into the cave, and then to fire him. And what maybe the Radbaz says, maybe what Hashem is trying to do is give Eliyahu Anavi a chance to do teshuva. He's trying to remind him of the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. Look at what Moshe did. When Moshe was on this mountain, the Jewish people did Chet Egel. But what did Moshe do? On this, in this very cave, <clears throat> he prayed the 13 attributes of God's forgiveness. Give him another chance. They're good people. They can do better. They can, uh, they can shape up. Go for 40 days, hoping that after all of this, 40 days, Har Sinai, in the cave, Eliyahu and Avi will learn the lesson. Wake up, man. It's time to be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Again, forgive me. I dare not speak of Eliyahu and Avi in such a flippant way, in such a disrespectful way. But this is what the Navi is trying, this is what the, the, the Midrash is trying to do. The Midrash is trying to hear, compare, and contrast the prophecies of Moshe and that of Eliyahu. The leadership of Moshe and that of Eliyahu. Moshe 
succeeded as a leader, knowing how to criticize the people when necessary, but right away defending them when necessary. Eliyahu and Avi, maybe you'll learn from Moshe. Go on a 40-day hike. Try to think about what it means, the life that Moshe lived. Go to Har Sinai. You know, when you go to a place, when you go to the Rebbe's Ohel, you, you try to internalize, what can I do to live like the Rebbe? You go to Har Sinai, maybe I could live up to these values of Moshe. Maybe I can gain forgiveness for people. And so Hashem says to him, What are you doing here? But maybe a little bit deeper, at Cesar by Bernstein, why do you think I led you here? Not just what are you doing here, but po. how do you think you got here? Why did I lead you specifically here? Think about who was once upon a time here and how they acted and what their job as a leader was. Maybe you can learn from their example. Eliyahu responds that I'm acting zealously on God's behalf because the people have forsaken your Torah. He was so consumed with the zeal on Hashem's behalf that even standing there in Moshe's place, he couldn't even see the message. He failed to consider that maybe he should act like Moshe Rabbeinu. At this stage, Hashem says to Eliyahu, well, leave the cave. And he brings this huge wind and a fire and an earthquake. And God's not in any of those. And finally, after the noise and after the fire, Lo Ba'esh Hashem. Hashem's not in those loud moments in life. But after the fire, kol demamadaka. There was a still, silent voice. Sound. The sound of silence. Vayhi Eliyahu. When Eliyahu heard the silence, vayalet panav be'adarto. He bound his face in his mantle. Vayetze. He leaves. Vayamod petach He goes to the entrance of the cave. And Eliyahu realizes that God is there in the silence. And now, after this vision, and, the, and, the, and, and I think the message is clear, the small sound implies that it's there that Hashem can be found. Yes, I have many powerful and fearsome agents. I could bring fire and I could bring scary things to kill people and I could make make buildings fall down and I could do a lot of scary things in the world. I could bring destruction, but that's not me. Hashem does not reside there in the fire and in the earthquakes, but rather in the small voice, in the kol de mamad daka, in the small voice of prayer, asking for forgiveness, asking for appeasement on behalf of somebody. And then God says to him, now I ask you again, Eliyahu, did you learn your lesson? Why are you here? And what's Eliyahu's response? Eliyahu's response is tragic. Kanokineti! I am extremely zealous on your behalf, Hashem, because your people have forsaken and violated your covenant. And it was at this stage, still not learning a lesson, not understanding that you need to pray on behalf of the people. Eliyahu, that's your job. That's what Moses did. Why are you not learning, Eliyahu? God says, well, if that's the case, maybe it's time for you to step down. Maybe it's time that Elisha take your place. Very powerful way of understanding the role of a prophet in the, um, in the scheme of, of history. We know that Eliyahu and Avi, by the way, makes a very heavy appearance throughout our lives. Where is it that Eliyahu is constantly in our day-to-day -day lives? Every, every time there's a brit milah. The Malach Haberit. He is the angel of the covenant, Eliyahu Navi. And therefore we put a chair for Eliyahu Navi. We put a chair for him to honor him at every brit milah. And we say, excuse me, Zeha Eliyahu Navi. This is the chair of Elijah the prophet. And one even has to say it. And if they don't say it, then he won't come. What is the source of Eliyahu Navi? Why is it he attending? Why not, um, why not um, Michael Navi, Gabriel Navi, Raphael Navi? A lot of prophets. 
Why specifically Eliyahu? The source again is in Perked de Rabbi Eliezer. And the Midrash relates, Amar lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says the Holy One to Eliyahu, Le'olam ata mekane, you're always acting zealously. Kineta bashitim, you acted zealously in shitim. Which parasha is that? Our parasha. When you killed Zimri, you acted like a zealot. Ve'kan ata mekane, you're acting with zealotry when you ran away from the people. Uh, in, in Har Karmel, killing all of those fake prophets. Chayecha, by your life, says God. En Israel osin brit mila. The Jewish people will not perform a bris. Until you come there to see it with your own eyes. Mikan, and therefore, based on this, Hitkinu hachamim, our rabbis instituted, Sheyehu osin moshav kevod, to make a seat of honor. For the angel of the covenant. How is this Midrash meant to be understood? Eliyahu is coming as a, um, to witness the Brit Milah. So on a simple level, it's because God again says to him, you are so excited for me, and therefore your reward is, you will there will never be Brit Milah without you first being there. We need you there. The show, the party cannot go on without you, Eliyahu. Because you are someone who appreciates the Brit. However, some understand that um, it's actually a response to Eliyahu's claim that the people have abandoned the covenant. Heferu, they have, they have forsaken your Torah. And God says, yeah, they've forsaken my Torah. That's how you talk about the Jewish people. That's how you defend them. Puma de Asid, the mouth that said that, the mouth that spoke derogatorily about Am Yisrael, must now come, witness the Brit Milah, and speak positively about them. Yeah, they don't keep my Brit Milah? On your life! Your punishment is to go to every Brit Milah and to see how, the, yes, they do, and come back and say, God, I apologize. I'm sorry that I said that about them. I actually take it back. They actually do love your Torah. They actually do keep your Brit Milah. And I was just at one, and they're doing it from A to Z. Let's scratch what I said. And so what's, what's true is that, and this is, and this is, this is Eliyahu Navi, by the way. This is what he is here to do. And um, maybe we can say today, after all the Brit Milahs that he has come to, he has... Um, seen and appreciates the virtue of Am Yisrael. He realizes that the Jewish people, no matter how much we do sin, are beautiful. And maybe for this reason, based on this knowledge of his, he is the one that's going to come and herald the future redemption. He is the one that's going to come and announce the arrival of Mashiach because there's no one better than him that is able to go back to Hashem and to say, God, the people, they, they are good. You could bring Mashiach. They do deserve to get redeemed. You know, if, you know and, and this is the message that we must take upon ourselves in these three weeks, especially in a time where there's unfortunately so much sinat chinam, so much hatred, which is why we lost the Ber HaMikdash. And this is a time that we must work on bringing it back by increasing our love for all types of Jews, to defend all types of Jews, to always speak dover tov le'amo, Doresh shalom lechozaro. Doresh tov lezaro. Right to to seek be a goodness on behalf of the Jewish people. Right. This story told about Rav Levi Yitzchak of Barditchev, one of my favorite stories. I believe we said this in the past, um, but um, it's worth repeating. Rav Levi Yitzchak of Barditchev one time he notices on Tisha B'Av a man is eating. He's eating on Tisha B'Av. He runs over and he says to this gentleman, he says to this fellow, you know, it's Tisha B'Av. I'm sure that you're unaware, but one's not allowed to eat on Tisha B'Av. He says to him, um, oh no, Rabbi, I'm fully aware that um, you're not allowed to eat on Tisha B'Av. He says, oh, well, did you know that today is Tisha B'Av? He says, yeah, Rabbi, today I'm fully aware that today is Tisha B'Av. He says, wow, so if you knew today is Tisha B'Av, and you know you're not allowed to eat on Tisha B'Av, it must be 
that you're sick. You must not be feeling well. That's why you're eating today on a fast day. He says, actually, Rabbi, never been better. I'm very healthy, feel fine, feel great. Selian Avi turns to the heavens and he says, Lord Almighty, look how beautiful your people are. Here I gave this man three chances to lie, and yet he will only tell the truth. That's a leader. That's a leader finding the good in every person, defending every Jew. The eating, it's Tisha B'Av. You're not sick. But you tell the truth. You're honest. To always speak with our fellow Jews in a benevolent manner and with a compassionate outlook. That's what we learned from Moshe. That's what Eliyahu Hanavi needs to learn by coming to every Brit Milah. And if we internalize these points, we will no doubt have more reason to anticipate the arrival of Eliyahu, bringing with him for Hashem's beloved people good tidings, salvations, and consolations. Beautiful words from Rabbi Bernstein. We'll stop over here. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye bye.